continue on today in the series we've been doing from the ashes. We've talked about the fact that at some point in our lives we've probably all been broken. Maybe we're going to be broken again as we realize some of our faults and our fallibilities and everything. And we're looking at examples through the Bible of how Jesus lived his life and some other Bible characters and to see the steps they went through and the principles that we need. And as we've gone through this so far, we started out talking about temptation. We realize... None of us are exempt from temptations as we examine the temptations that Jesus himself faced. We all will face temptations, so we have to learn how to stand up against them. In the second week, we talked about humility, the humility that we have to have, our state of mind and how we look at things. We need to remember that humility. And then we talked last uh, time about contemplation, how we take time to meditate and think about God's word and the, what it all means. And we have to spend time mulling it over, so to speak. So we have to do that. So we want to go on this week and we want to talk about the, the next thing, confession. Do we all know what confession means? We're going to find out today. Maybe we can have some new aspects on it. Maybe you understand this better than I do, but uh, we'll find out. So if we want to start out, let's stand together and read uh, the passage that's been our theme passage for this whole series. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've been teaching us through this series and what you, we believe you are going to teach us today. So at this time, we ask that you would allow us to focus on your words, focus on the things you've done, focus on the things we need in our lives. Allow us to uh, listen attentively, to hear your voice as you guide each and every one of us and turn us into the people you would have us to be. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Confession. Okay, I have a confession to make. I struggled with this message. I come to find out that I don't fully know what confession is. Maybe somewhere deep inside I knew, but I didn't understand all of it. It was kind of, and it's, you know, apparently other people do too, because I went and one of the things I do when we look for a topic like this is a phrase, I like, what does that mean? So I go to the dictionary and look and say, what's the definition? The definitions are from different, different dictionaries didn't make sense. They didn't sound like they melded together real well. So I picked out the principles of that, and I tried to summarize it a little bit as to what I feel it's trying to tell us. So let's look at the definition I came up for for this word. There's two principles of confession, two primary principles. They actually interrelate. They go together. It's hard to have one without the other, but you've got to study a little bit and understand it before you understand the, the interrelations. The, the first one, which is what I would commonly think of, and I'm assuming maybe I'm wrong, that a lot of us probably think of, it's the admission of sins or faults. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that about you. I, I know I was mean to you the other day. I was uncourteous. I apologize. I confess. That's what we think. I've sinned against God. I need to confess. Or maybe some of our faults, we just did something wrong and it wasn't necessarily, a, we might not call it a sin, but it was still a fault. That's a confession, is it not? Which kind of is one of the reasons I struggle with the definitions, dictionary definitions. Most of the definitions are specifically using the word confession in a spiritual matter. I think the concept can be used other places, but we primarily want to focus on the physical end. So that's the first part of it. But confession also means a profession of belief, such as spiritual convictions or lifestyle convictions or goals. I added that second little part in there myself because I think it applies there too. Uh, you know, a con confession could be a, I'm going to do good at this. You know, it could be the goals and the statements of faith we've made. But... Confession of space and spiritual is, I confess the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Is that a confession? There's a difference between the confession, which is an apology for what you've done wrong, or a confession of what I believe. And how do they tie together, and how do they work? So we're going to try and look at that a little bit today. But uh, to start out with, let's uh, look at some of the Bible verses about confession, where we've seen it used in the Bible. 
actually when I look at confession, I, I did look it up uh, to search to see how many times, you will find the concept of confession probably more times than it's listed. But you can see it in there. The actual confession, I only looked in the NIV because, you know, we have different translations of the Bible, so that'll just have one Bible. The word confession itself, it's only translated as confession five times in the whole Bible. Confess is 21 times. Um, which was interesting. The five times, the actual confession seemed to relate to that second definition, the profession of faith. Confess usually meant asking of forgiveness for sins. So if we go on to these Bible verses here, first thing we want to look at is verses relating to confession of sin. What does confession of sin mean? And who made this, did this in the Bible? Well, first off, in Luke we find, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Here we have the disciple, Peter, confessing to the Lord, I'm sinful. I've been wrong. Well, that was important, wasn't it? Because Peter had to get over himself a little bit, didn't he? Wasn't Peter the one he thought he could do anything? He was so impetuous, wanted to do everything, and he had to be broken down and realize, I have to confess my faults and that I don't know everything. So Peter, that was a confession of sins there. We have another one on confession of sins. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Now this passage came out of the uh, story on the prodigal son, did it not? Here it was important why in confession of sins is so important. Because it wasn't until he could confess of his sins and his faults and what he did wrong that he could grow and move ahead. You know, as long as you're wallowing in your self-centeredness and doing what you're doing and thinking you've got all the answers, you're not going anywhere. At some point you have to say, I can't do this myself. If I want to grow, I'm going to have to do something different. How many of you reached that point in your life? I've told you about it before. That's what, you know, most of my life, even though I grew up in the church, God was just a possibility. And it wasn't until after I reached a point where I said, something's wrong, something's not working. But I started to say, I don't have all the answers. I still don't have all the answers. My wife doesn't think so, but... Uh, I don't have all the answers. And I have to realize my faults, my weaknesses, my things I'm doing wrong, because if I don't, I'm never going to look for the right answers. So let's go on to another part of this confession of sins, which is professing Christ. This is that second definition we had there, right? Well, who did this? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, didn't we just talk about Peter? He confessed his sins, but he also declared Jesus as Lord. He did them both. Do we have to do them both? I think so. Let's see if we got another uh, passage on this. In John, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Anybody remember who said that? The woman at the well. Our church is the well. That very well we're talking about. That's where it came from. The Samaritan woman. An outcast. A sinful woman. And suddenly she met this man, Jesus, at the well, who told her all these amazing things. He told her things that she didn't tell him. He already knew this about her and told us all this stuff. And what did she do after that? She became... The first missionary to Samaria. The outcast in Samaria. And what did she do? She ran to town and she says, Oh, you got to come see this man I met. He's got to be the Messiah. He's told me all these things. Who else could tell me such things? That is a profession of faith, a profession of belief. She professed that I believe this man that I have met is the Messiah. And she was willing to state it, even if it meant shame and ridicule, because, you know, she wasn't very well accepted in town with her lifestyle. But she said, this is more important. Professing what you believe and who you believe in is important because it gives you strength, it gives you courage, it gives you power.
We need to profess that. And another interesting thing in this passage, if you look at that, when you think about it, how many of you thought, I really can't witness to people, I can't testify, I can't do a whole lot because I'm still learning this, and I've got so much more to learn. Do you know that oftentimes God takes those who know very little and uses that and magnifies it? It's within his power. This woman had just accepted that this is a Messiah and she's already telling everybody. That's who oftentimes is used mightily. It's not the deep scholars who have their heads in the books all day long. It's the people who are willing to go out and just profess it and live it. And let's look at another category here. Professing or denying Christ. I wonder it looks at the fact that there's a choice here. Look at this, look at this passage in Matthew. Jesus says, Whomever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. This is a choice and its consequences. The choice of whether or not we profess Christ as Lord and Savior. Confession of Christ needs to be done in word, actions, and deeds. It says profess to other people. What do you do? It means we tell people about Jesus. No, it's like Dr. Matt said when he was here last week. He said we don't go out and preach on the preacher corners like the, you know, quoting scripture in, in an obnoxious way, overbearing way. But we find a way to build relationships with people, but we are not afraid to, in the conversation, pull out the fact that, yeah, I once struggled with those same things, and this is what happened with me. I got to meet Jesus, and this is what he convicted me of. Tom and I were talking about this earlier, too. Be careful how you present it. Do it in conversation. It's not a debate. To you, it's been decided. It hasn't to them. If you want to come down and pound the Word of God into somebody, they are going to shut you out. But you have to look for that time in the conversation to present your viewpoints in a way that's non-threatening that, but makes them think. How many of you were forced to believe in Christ? If you were, I feel sorry for you because I wonder if you've made a true commitment. We have to choose that. But in this passage, he's saying... You need to profess me to others. That way I know you love me enough and I'll tell my father about you. But if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you too. Oh, you mean I can't just come to church on Sunday? That isn't good enough? No, not according to Scripture. We have to live it. We have to show it through what we say to people, how we treat people. If all you do is come to church on Sunday or watch the videos, messages online, and say, I'm a Christian, but that's all you ever do. No, you're performing religious acts. Christianity is something we live. And it's a choice we have to make. There are multiple stories in the Bible that we could look at to show this confessional uh, interaction, but we're in what season right now? Easter season, right? So let's see if we can tie something that ties into the Easter season that shows this. Uh, we could have used prodigal son or any number of passages, but we recently preached on that anyway. So let's look at the Easter season story on this. And let's walk through this and see what we see. First, two other men, both criminals, were also led with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, where they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up clothes by casting lots. So what's happening here? First off, we're seeing in this opening of this passage, we're seeing Jesus has been taken out to Golgotha. He's put on the cross, but he's not alone. There's three crosses. We often see that pictured in pictures, the three crosses, because there were three of them there. Jesus is in the middle, and there's a thief over here and a thief over here. Uh, depending on what version of the Bible you find, it may call them criminals, may call them thieves. But if you go back to the original Greek word, you'll find that the word that was used for them indicated that they were some kind of thieves. That was their crime. They were thieves. So you've got these two. Question, you ever think about it? Was this coincidental that all three of these were uh, put to death on the same day? 
or was this planned? To intentionally put Jesus in between two criminals who were despised and shame was brought upon them with the way they were publicly executed? Was this not more of an attempt to drag Christ down and put shame on him, to associate him with shameful people? It looked like there was a big plan to discredit him. So he goes and says, the people stood watching. The rulers even stared at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. So you got two groups of people at men's here. He said, the people were watching. You know, all these people are standing here. Everybody comes out to see the execution, right? It's the show. What do you think the attitudes of the people were? It doesn't really say in this passage, but you know many of them were left there for the show. Many were there to ridicule him. Somewhere mixed in there, there were probably a few dedicated followers. And there were those who were followers, and now they're in a state of disbelief. They don't know what's happening. They're lost. But you got a whole mixture of people. But it even says the rulers and leaders were sneering at him. Why? They had to justify themselves by putting Jesus down. They were more important than Jesus because they had never made a profession of faith to Jesus Christ. And it says, the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, if you are the king of Jews, save yourself. Even the soldiers mocked him. Everybody's putting him down. Nobody wants to bow down to Jesus. Nobody wants to admit that he's the king. You're starting to see where profession of faith is important. If you don't make a profession of faith, you're going to be caught up in your own opinions and you're going to justify yourself. And that's what was happening to all these people. They had never professed him as Christ. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. Well, we know that he truly was the king of the Jews. But that's not what the sign was put there for. And not what he was being taken. This was to laugh at him. Ha! <laughs> you say you're the king? You're nothing. Look at you now. <laughs> Go ahead, save yourself if you think you're the king. And they sat and ridiculed him. Then one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. He's just mocking him and ridiculing him and wouldn't accept him as, as, as a Lord. He's dying himself and he's still going to uh, hurl insults. Why? Because he can't accept what's happening place and what he did wasn't right. He was working under his own power the whole time. But there were two thieves, right? What did the other one say? But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Now, this is a passage you should, right here, these two verses are good ones to analyze. There's a lot in here. You realize both types of confessions are in here? Both are in the same brief statement. Look at it. The profession of God says, Don't you fear God? Did he not profess right there that God is real? He made a profession that he does believe in God. Even after everything's gone wrong, it's come to him the realization and he's now saying, don't you fear God? God is real. And then he looks over at Jesus and he says, but this man, he's done nothing wrong. He is professing the innocence of Christ. And a confession of sin, so he says, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. Did he not just confess at that point that he had been wrong? Both work together. We have to do both. And then we conclude this passage which says, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It's again, choices and consequences. 
One thief denied him. One thief would not acknowledge that he was the Lord. And he was lost forever. I don't think we have any question of where he ended up. But this other thief acknowledged him. What did he say there? He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was now acknowledged him as not only this man beside him, but he had acknowledged God. Now he's understanding that you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. And he's probably thinking, why didn't I see this sooner? But he has acknowledged him. He has professed him as Lord and Savior. He's already admitted his faults. And he was saved. Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. It's important that we practice both forms of confession. Confessions of belief and confession of sin. The two are interrelated. Now, if you go and study in the Old Testament, where a lot of times in the confessions there, you would see confessions of statements of belief. I confess in the Lord God. I confess I believe this. I confess I believe this. I confess I believe this. You know why that's so important? Because when you raise your hand in praise and acknowledge the superiority of God, you will be forced in some way or another, whether visibly or within your heart, to bow to your knee and say, I am less than you, and I need your help. And until you acknowledge him as greater, you will never put yourself in place. And this is not a type of kneeling to where you think yourself is dirt. No, if you have accepted Christ, you are valuable. You are a child of God. You are part of the royal family. But... When you are part of that royal family, you have a huge responsibility. And you need to remember your place. God is still higher. We are still important, but we need to put ourselves as all about priorities and perspective and where we're at. To come down and realize, I need you. I can't do this on my own. My way doesn't work. So I trust in you as being the almighty ruler of the whole universe. It's amazing how you list how, listen how he'll work in your lives. I was struggling last week to put together, you know, that little, I use a video illustration before we go to the message. Uh, and we run that partially so it's time for our children to leave and go. So we put that in. Uh, and a lot of times I try and find in a, uh, a video that has some kind of tie into my message. But I didn't preach last week, did I? The DS was here. I didn't know what his message was going to be like. How do I tie it in? I'm sitting there wondering, oh, where do I come up with this? I said, Lord, you've got to help me. And all of a sudden, it popped in my mind. And I searched on that, and sure enough, I found a video. The video we played last week was a direct revelation from God. If we profess him as Lord and we are willing to listen for him. I was sitting this morning, I'm sitting there, and the phrases keep going through my mind of a song. I tied right into the here. Now, my wife can tell you, I've told you before, my memory as far as quoting scripture off the top of my head or knowing an exact song or knowing who did it, I don't necessarily remember it. But sometimes a phrase will come to me. And I'll Google it and that's how I find it. So I went and there's a little phrase and I pointed to a song that I think we ought to listen to the words because as we do songs before, uh, when we come into worship, what are we doing in most of those songs? We are praising God, we're praising Him magnificence, and we are making profession of Christ. It's important that we do that. So our song time is important. And this song came to my mind, said, You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God to whom all praises due, I stand in all of you. 
Do we make that profession? Do we recognize how powerful he is and how wonderful he is? Confession, as I said, is all about priorities and perspective. When we profess Christ, we elevate him above ourselves and we recognize our own needs. It is about us coming in submission underneath of God and being willing to confess him as Lord. John the Baptist came right before Jesus, right? John displayed that. He had become this preacher that everybody wanted to come here because, you know, they came out to hear this man who had all these great words and prophecies and he's becoming real important. And he could have sat and tried to create his own little kingdom, right? But what did he do? Well, we see several passages that what John said. In John 3.30 we find, He must become greater and I must become less. He never said I have to be unimportant. I'm not dirt. He was so important. But he says, my job is to elevate Christ. I am a servant for Christ. And that's the attitude we have to have. And then also about John, we find in Luke 3.16, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. He's saying, as, as important as he was and all the people listening to him and as famous as he became, compared to Christ, that's how low he said he was. He was willing to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. So let me ask you, have you clearly made the Lord of your life? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Or are you just playing with it? What sins in your life may need to be confessed so that your relationship with Christ can be restored? I struggle with that one, which comes first. Sometimes it's confessing our faults and sins that allows us to see Christ higher. Kind of like the chicken and the egg which came first. Or is it when we profess that we see our sins? I think they bounce back and forth because, you know, we profess and we see some of our sins and or whichever we cap in first, I think they go back and forth. It is by pursuing both forms of confession that we're going to grow. So that's what we have to look for. So let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message today, Lord. We do acknowledge you as the Lord of our lives, and we realize that you are the one who made us. You are the one we owe everything to. You are the one that can guide us through every turmoil and trouble spot in our lives. So we ask that you would guide us and give us courage and strength to not only profess you openly, not in private, but openly to make sure everybody knows who we are following and also give us the courage to confess to our sins and our faults and to allow you to cleanse us and turn us into the people you would have us to be. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.